Well, I'm pumped for this conversation, man. I've been I've been following your content, reading about you. I've seen so much sort of interesting stuff that you're putting out. Um, but just as a, like maybe a foray into the conversation, when somebody asks, like, what do you do? How do you respond? You know how if I put in front of you a great Ford Fiesta and a red Ferrari and I ask you what you pick, you will always pick the Ferrari? Of course. I had clients feel that way about you and your company. So that, that's normally my pitch. It usually gets people more entertained than explaining the whole thing that brand strategy is. It's more to the point. Yeah. I love that. And what are your, like, when you're thinking about partner brands that you want to work with, what are you, what are you looking for? First of all, I'm looking that you value the work, meaning if you are the kind of person that thinks that, yeah, I will invest in brands when I get to 10 million in revenue, when I become Apple, or if you think that a brand is a logo or that a brand is your website, we are probably not a good fit to work together. However, if you already value, like, your reputation, if you value how your customer sees you, then we are most likely a good match. And then of course there's the whole value things and like industries I wouldn't partner with, but that's another conversation. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really good criteria. What do you think people, so branding is like this big concept, right? Like, and I, I've heard you speak so eloquently about positioning and that's just such a, I think an intricate topic too, but maybe as a sort of like entry point, what, one, what do people get wrong about branding? And two, how does your definition maybe differ from how other people are defining the concept of brand? Well, we have to start by the definition of branding. Like the most accepted definition comes from Martin Neumeyer, which goes that branding is the people's gut feeling about you. And that's it. Now, uh, the common definition right now of branding is that people attribute to branding anything and everything. Your profile picture, your banner on social media, your content, your following. Everyone is, everybody says everything is a brand. Companies will think their website is a brand. So that's the common definition. My definition brings off from New Myers. And I would add that brand is, yes, the gut feeling that people get about you, but it's also how people perceive you and ultimately it's your reputation at scale. Yeah. I, I love that. How people perceive you and what's the space that you're occupying in, in their mind. Yes. Well, Brands like mental real estate. That's another one, a metaphor I love. Yeah. Did you come up with that? I love that. Mental real estate. I think I came up with that. I'm not sure though. So maybe somebody did before and I just didn't, <laughs> didn't find them, but I, I think I came up with that mental real estate. Yeah. I love that. You gave this brilliant example um, that I would love for you to walk us through on the, the copy thinkers community where you compare um, the Audi RS Q8 versus the Lamborghini Urus. And I might be pronouncing this wrong, but can you, can you give that? A, I, I, I thought that was such a brilliant example. Can you walk us through? Uh, how, how you use that example when you're sort of talking to clients? Car examples are great because even people who are not car people, they understand cars because they are around us every time. And especially uh, everyone in Germany will know what an Audi is because many people own one. Everyone in Italy or in anywhere in Europe will understand that because they want one and same in America. It's like they see us as these great things. And Lamborghini is the same. So that's why the example works. It also works because thanks to my works, I mean, I cannot fully disclose the whole scope of the thing, but I was close to a product manager at Audi and we were having this conversation at an event. And I like the guy tells me, out of, out of nowhere, you know, we had chatted before. He just decides to tell me, you know that the RSQ8 and the Lamborghini Euros are the same car. And I'm like, Fuck what? They are what? It's like, it, it, he goes on to explain to me the chassis, the electronics, everything, the engine, the car is the same. The only mm. thing that changes is the exterior and the interior. And that stuck with me so much that it became a center of, it became like the epicenter of I explain brand to people because you have 
you have two machines that mechanically are the same. What changes are just the looks, the vibe, the perception, how you feel about them because the euros is way more aggressive. And the price, of course, and what determines the price? Because we are talking about a 230K car against a car that's 130K. So what justifies 100,000 euros or dollars more in price for the, for the Lamborghini Euros? And thinking about it, I was like, brand, of course, is how people perceive Lamborghini, is how the meaning people attach to Lamborghini. And that, but that's why it's extraordinary. It's like on a, on a smaller, way smaller scale, this, you know, this is the Apple Magic Mouse in black, mm. which will cost you 10 bucks more than the white one. And this is just a matter of perception. Apple realized that designers loved the black one. That it, it somehow it became a, a status symbol among designers. I own a black mouse. And that's how they decided to charge more for it. And their audience just accepted that. And they pay, we pay more for it because I have one. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's how it works. It's fascinating. Like what, in your opinion, I know there's so much to sort of unpack here, right? Um, but when you're talking about the perception and you're thinking about the different levers, w whether it's sort of status, um, you know, or that the association or all these other things that sort of go into brands, like what are the biggest levers that you think about potentially sort of pulling, right? Or that you think about this mental real estate that somebody sort of has about a brand. How are you thinking about let's sort of change the positioning of how this brand is perceived? First, you need to understand how it is perceived, right? Which is not done through like data and dashboards, which I know it's like super in nowadays to, to quantify everything. However, you need to go a layer deeper and go into the stuff that many data people don't like, which is the intangibles. And you try to, mm -hmm. you interview the customer base and you understand like, what is the current state of this brand? What do they like about it? Why do they? go to this place, what do they buy from this company? And you will see that there's always, unless the company is a, a, a fucking clusterfuck of disaster, you will always see that there is a pattern. Of course, some outliers, but there is a pattern. In one case, we help a local business, which my company doesn't usually, but sometimes, you know, projects are fun. And this guy, is, this guy wasn't a hairstylist. And interviewing the, the customer base, we realized people are coming for this dude's personality. And they're paying more just because they like this dude. And the dude could actually char charge more. Now, we never got him to charge more for the time we had him as a client. But we did get him to leverage his personality in a way that attracted, attracted, attracted more people, which we did by basically just doubling down on like, the concept of archetypes and mm. then transmitting that into language and applying that to the benefit they give, he gives customers. Now for a big company, something you see very often, especially in service providers is the teams. Clients go, I love how this company works. I love how their teams take care of us. I love how their professionalism in projects. And that's many people will think, okay, but how do you, how do you scale a team? How do you make that part of the positioning? You do that through company culture. And that's where brand strategy starts affecting culture because a great culture builds great products or, great, or provides great services. And then you will work on making sure that either this culture stays as it is or even improves and delivers even better results. So yes, you can leverage Perfect. many tools from values to purpose to archetypes, depends on what is going on. And in some cases though, let's say that you come into a company and they are dealing with a, I had an example time ago on Twitter, like sales are tanking and the, the product is bad and the brand is bad. When everything is bad, usually it's connected to the fact that the product sucks. Mm. So the whole thing about this is that the product has to be good first. And if it sucks, you have to fix simultaneously both the product and the brand. Yeah. Yeah. That makes it, that makes it a ton of sense. How do you draw that through line between company culture and brand um because that's such an interesting sort of dichotomy right and i think like a, a lot of people maybe sort of see the two as sort of like separate but related in some magic kind of way 
you're drawing like I think a, a direct through line between the two. So how do you think about that connection and the, the between the two? Such a good question. There is a direct connection actually, and that's in the first of all in the values, right? Normally, when two companies merge, for example, the main issue you will see is that the new, the acquired employees, they come in and they don't match the values and they don't feel they identify with them. Which is why mm -hmm. mergers should come with tons of internal work. Once you get the values, you also should provide some purpose. It's been proven by several studies that as a, like a company purpose, which is their why beyond money, not only affects revenue, but it affects also employee performance. And you really need people to be feeling like their work matters. That has some kind of impact for them to perform to some, to some extent, because if their work is just like monkey bottom pushing, it's not gonna, it's not gonna fare well for the company. Mm -hmm. the, the straight line there is a mix then of values, purpose, and I would say even vision. You know, every group needs to have a vision. They strive towards. There needs to be this. There needs to be this thing where you have a present situation. This is who we are, and you have a future where this is who we could be. And you need to bridge that gap. Now, all of this is enacted through a bunch of initiatives of like. We call them rituals, probably, like mm -hmm. habits people have, an internal language you develop, of course, everything that pertains to a community, but the starting point of it is brand. Yeah, that's, that's huge. It's, um, and I love the fact that you just said the starting point is brands, because I sort of think of it in the lens of like, I think of like the company culture as like the, um, it's like the starting place. So I, I love that. I love the way that you just reframe that for me. When you're sort of thinking about, um, or, or maybe like a, a better way to sort of ask this is, if you've got, have you, have you worked with examples or seen examples of places that have a strong company culture, right? They're, they've got a great vision. They've got the purpose. They've got the vision. They've got these sort of different sort of pieces going in place, but their brand doesn't occupy the mental real estate that they should or could. Yeah. Have you seen examples like that? And how do you work or work them to sort of say, okay, like we, we need the external, we need to occupy this better space. How do you end up tackling that? I saw an example of that where the company had an extraordinary culture and some brand awareness in the country where they started, but then they expanded countries, which is perfect. Of course, new markets, whatever. But in those markets, they had no brand awareness whatsoever. Like literally nobody knew who the fuck these guys were, even though they were good. So yeah. in that case, you have to work on positioning. You have to understand what the competitors are doing. And you have to basically go a different direction or an opposite direction. And you need to make, you need to make it very clear to the customers and to the public that what's your, your value proposition, what makes you different from all the other providers. Now the challenge is if the, what makes you different is only the culture, at the beginning, people who don't work with you will not care. Mm -hmm. Because the client in, in service industries, for example, the client doesn't feel the effect of the culture before buying. They mm -hmm. feel that during the project, but it's something that's very hard to convey. Because again, we're, especially in like in technical stuff, like IT service providers, clients will benefit from that culture, but they will never make the connection. They will only feel these teams make me feel great and deliver great results, but they will never bridge that gap. That's the culture. So you need to have a unique selling proposition that goes beyond that and that positions you, okay, okay, these guys are the go-to, which usually will mean that you either specialize in something or for everything that you do, you do, you find a unique way of expressing that service and or of finding the benefit that you give the client or the extra mile you go for them in providing that. Yeah. And how do you surface that, right? Because um, I'm thinking back to like the, the examples that I do, that I, I work through um, and I work as a higher ed consultant and there's so many like places that I work with, right, that have this pitch that they think distinguishes them in the market, right? Like one on one student attention, right? And individualized like learning and like, uh, you know, like all this kind of stuff. And all of the competitors are saying the exact same thing, 
right? And, and they're looking like they're trying to figure out like, why don't I own this mental real estate? And it's like, they're getting the same pitch from like eight different colleges. Like they're, you're not unique. How, how do you think about sort of surfacing that like and, and digging and finding here's the thing, right? Because I feel like it's usually way more specific than, um, than most places realize. But how do you, how do you think about it? It has to be specific. And it's funny because this situation is so complex and at the same time, so simple. <laughs> like the simple part is just look at your competitors, realize you're doing the exact same things they do and stop doing that. Right. That, that's the starting point. But once you get them to understand, okay, we need to stop doing this, you need to get them to understand how we stop doing that. For example, those that involve even visually just using a different visual language than the one our competitors are using. Or those that involve maybe using a different verbal expression other than that of our competitors. Because, you know, you will see this not only in education, but in tech, in software. They all say the same. They sound the same. The websites are all white and blue or blue and green or white and green. There's not, there's not much de deviation for that. Then once you, get, once you nail a new way of expressing the company, a new way of visualizing the company, which usually are the last things, actually, what, what you need to do, understand is that you need to take a step back and you need to start again from the beginning. Like, is this company going somewhere? Does this company or this institution have a vision for their students or for their clients? What is that vision? Maybe it's that what differentiate them. They don't have them. Do they have a purpose? Are they investing in, are they committed to this social cause? Could they use that as a differentiator? They can't. Maybe then it's the values. Are they very original with their values? Which again, is super hard to achieve in that case. So I wouldn't recommend that as a differentiator. Or maybe... Are they kind of rebellious? They, is there something they don't like about their own industry that they can call out to make headlines and get attention? That's another one. Otherwise you go technical, like, okay, we provide this service. Here's how we provide it that is special. Of course, the challenge here is providing it in a way that is actually special and that you didn't copy for your, from your competitors. So that's the balance you have to keep. And also things like, what we describe first, everything that's values, everything that's vision, everything that's purpose, all that stuff has to come from leadership. Because committee culture has never delivered anything good. If you have 300 employees and you ask each one of them what they think about the brand and you try to implement it all in your brand, it will tank. It's just destined to fail. That's why there needs to be a strong leadership that says, this is who we are. Okay, we ask our employees, this is how it matches to what you expect, but this is who we are, and this is where we are going. This is our new direction, because if not, you will get this watered down version of a brand. And that's how you get ultimately to all of this stuff, like same language as the competitors, same website as the competitors, same customer journey, same expectations, which leads to nothing. That's, that's huge. Well, I, I love, I love the, the sort of reframing that you've got around like values, purpose, vision, and really focusing on that core. And that's the starting place. And I think that's where so many places sort of go wrong. You talked about the last step, right? Of, you know, so we've got the first step and the last step, you know, you've got this, the core, the leadership, the, you know, the values, purpose, what direction are we going and who are we? Like those big identity pieces. We've talked a little bit about corporate culture. You touched quickly on the last step of like that visual identity and some of those pieces, like what are those in-between steps, right? And I know this is going to be like so individual and so, you know, sort of unique to different pieces, but like, what are the pieces that you have to sort of like figure out in between around like, how are we showing up and what's our identity and all those kind of pieces? Yeah. Well, from a values and culture perspective, it will start with start testing out new habits. Do we need new meetings where everybody participates? Do we need new ways of communication? Because maybe in your meetings, everybody's talking on top of each other. Do we need to reevaluate our leadership? Because maybe, you know, culture is a very delicate thing. You can give values from management, but in the end, the values will influence what makes the actual co culture, which is the individual teams. Those teams have managers. If those managers are not, are not 
suited for leadership, you need to change them. Otherwise, they will ruin your culture. Once you have that, you need the habits, like the meetings, the language you use in common. You try to develop initiatives where people spend time together, have experiences together, and start creating actually that comradeship that ends up making a culture. Now, when it comes to vision and vision and the more intangible stuff, that's need, that needs to be communicated often because people forget in the hassle of the daily work. That needs to be expressed often. Now, I mentioned communication, and then we go to external communications. That before we get there, we need to, again, go to the in-betweens. And the in-betweens is, what's our personality? Based on this value, based on what our customers believe, because you also need to take into account the customer, interviewing the customer, analyzing their mindset, they're analyzing their psychological profiles. What do these customers like? What do they believe in? How do we match that? Which language matches that? And then you start building what that's an in-between, a brand personality. And a brand personality is a personification of your company, almost as if it were a person. It's a full system from beliefs to opinions to opinionated takes that makes your brand feel alive. Now that comes with stuff that's called like the brand dictionary. So specific words and sentences your brand will use. And all of those things then come together to shape your communication strategy, which is then your marketing, which is your PR, which is, you know, something you should have and many brands don't have is a plan to, to handle a crisis. How do you handle a crisis? What does it happen when the manager fucks up and the media is talking shit about them? Do we stand with them? Do we out them? Like you, you see it recently, like there's been some international cases, especially in Italy, with this world famous influencer, her name is Chiara Ferrani, and uh, she she happened she happened to steal one million that was supposed to go to charity, and uh, the PR company that has her in charge had the brilliant idea of telling her to do the classic influencer apology, dressed in gray, no makeup, crying, saying that he was in good faith. Of course, nobody bought it because that's a bad agency, but. You need, you need to have protocols for that because in her case, there could have been a protocol to follow that saved face, but now it's too late. So you need also to have like these emergency measures. And those are all the in-betweens that needs to be on the, need to be on the back end because they end up affecting even your customer service. For example, you need rule of, rules of engagement. Your sales team needs to know the positioning so that they have good pitches to make so that they can identify, hey, this way we're different. Because if you don't identify how your company is different, you also kind of charge a lot. You end up on the race to the bottom. So yeah, the in-betweens are, again, going back to the question, are like brand personality and everything that makes it up and cultural initiatives and building that, that internal vibe that then seeps to the outside. And of course, again, the whole center of this is the customer. You need to know them. Without that, you are nowhere. This is, a, this is incredible advice. Um, and, and just to maybe sort of dig a little bit deeper, because you mentioned so many like really sort of critical pieces here. What kind of questions are you asking when you're, when you're trying to dig into brand personality and understand, you know, the, the customer discovery side and talk to customers and sort of like, what kind of things are you asking? Like, what are your, what are your strategies for really sort of getting at like the, the core essence of the brand and understanding how we can sort of better position this organization. When you're, when you're talking both to customers and internal stakeholders, like you need to take for granted that their first three answers is not what you want, actually want to hear. Cause it takes a while to go deep with people. Yeah. So why did you buy from, from this company? They will tell you a story. It's usually a surface level story. That is like, yeah, I found them on a trade fair. They talked to me and we have signed a contract. You have to, of course, carry it smart, right? It's not just why, why, why. But then you go to a point, okay, what happened at this point of what you mentioned? Let's say that they jump into a meeting. How was that meeting? And they will tell you this meeting, why it was that? And I felt this way. Why did you feel this way? They will tell you, well, you know, because the company had a really strong way of defining how they do this process. So hmm. what's paid and then... They gave you a hint, the process. So what's special about that process? And you start digging in with the customers until you find the real quest, like the real answer that you want, which is why they picked this company. Same with employees. 
Why do you work here for money? Most of them. Of course, it's fine. But besides that, do you enjoy your colleagues? Do you enjoy your team? Yes. Why do you enjoy your team? Because of this reason. Of course, you hope they enjoy the team because if they say no, you also have to find out why and then report to management. So with client, then with positioning is a little bit tricky because they ha there's habits and there's the status quo. And the status quo is we've always done it this way. This is how we sell. This is what the company does. And sometimes there are many moving pieces. There are many people involved. There are the technical people and the sales people, which are completely different and they work in separate teams. You need to talk to both and start to understand why is this special? How can your sales colleagues sell this? Why does this matter? The difficult part there is, you know, trying to weed through all the technicalities that they will tell you and trying to find, trying to put their mindset, their mind in a frame that this is the benefit for the customer. Once you get that, you can start finding something to hook into for your positioning. Like, you know, a term tech people love is like scalable infrastructure, yeah. which, which literally the, the prospect reads that shit in blanks. The, their brain is blanking. This doesn't mean anything. So you need to talk to those people. It's like, what does that mean? What is the benefit of this? Because, well, you know, it allows the customer more flexibility for that. Okay. But why is that flexibility matters and eventually they will come to something like because it saves them money or because it saves them working hours and then you have something you can sell mm. because it needs to be tangible because you know architectures infrastructures all those big words it means nothing but you need to make it you need to bring it down to earth which again is not their fault because people have an expertise and they are so used to navigating that, that they think that everybody's thinking the same way they do. So they tell you scalable infrastructure and it, for them, it's obvious, but you always have to tell them, but for your client, it isn't, even though your client is a CTO, maybe they have some other shit to deal with and they don't have time to actually quantify that or just label that as a benefit. Mm. That's huge. That's so, so much, so much insight there. Um, what, what, what for you, like when you're, when you're looking at these brands or you're sort of working with like with places, what are the signs that a business needs to reposition or it might be time to sort of like rethink how they're sort of positioning themselves in, in the market? Any examples come to mind or, or different cues that, that pop up? Well, the first sign is they merged or they're looking to merge, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's, it's not a sign. It's, it's an early marker. It's like an yeah. alarm signal. You want to merge. You need to be ready for what's coming, because if you like anything about this company, it's about to change. And if you don't take care of it, it's going to change back. That, that's one sign. The other sign is they're losing market share. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm consulting this business and they're like, well, you know, these other competitors recently entered the market and they have been taking up audience from me. And I'm, I'm, we are still at the phase of why. Why did it take up? Like, what is it? I took a look at the competitors and part of it I see, which is some com competitors are just more specialized in a specific thing, which of course is going to take up some market share from you, but the others almost, they look exactly the same. Mm. So then you need to understand what is it that's going on there. So yes, market share that's decreasing, you know, sales get harder because maybe something was commoditized. So sales get harder, for example. There is this company, they are offering a chat GPT for other companies. You take all your company knowledge, you, get, you give it to this company, and they will make your own GPT for your enterprise that can chat with you about the in and outs of your company. What's the issue with the GPT store? That got disrupted. So there's no USP anymore there. Mm -hmm. The client is actually saving money in using just chat GPT. So what's the, what's the USP there? You know, we're in Europe. So probably the USP is that you could have compliance issues with customer data. Hmm. If you have experts on board that can do that. Oh yes, we have them. Okay, then that's a selling point. Like you will not get a 1 million bucks fine for violating customer data. Pretty hefty, nice to avoid. Hmm. So that's disruptions, uh, market share. Otherwise just. Hitting a new market, 
I'm aiming at getting a client that's about to expand and they only have a base in, a, in, a, in Italy and they want to hit a new market, that needs new positioning because you need to understand new audiences. So that's another one. What else? Uh, launching new products. Sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, you launch a new product, it needs to be positioned. But what if your product doesn't actually fit your business strategy, which is something that I a touch upon too, and uh, you're actually just doing it because you're chasing a trend. Like on the, on the short term, it's going to seem like a good idea because it's going to give you money. On the long term, it might take away from the things your company actually does well. Just imagine, in my case, I have a UX designer in my team. I could be tempted to just have him create his own like sub-company where he just does websites. Hmm. But I need that guy for strategy. And if he's doing websites, that's one brain I'm losing for my strategy that makes more money than a website. That's why, okay, on the short term, it will give me money. Eventually, I will have a customer project where I will need him and he will not be available. I lost money and probably lost a customer. But it just, it's all the stuff you have to consider when why. Or there was, you know, the easiest one. You notice that your customers just don't relate to the brand anymore. They're just indifferent to it. They could just swap you tomorrow. Mm. Or they, and, and the first symptom of that is that some clients already swapped you. And in that case, you might need some brand work. Those are, those are incredible examples. What, what, what is, and, and I'm trying not to insert my own bias too much with this question, right? Cause I used to, I used to work at this um, university and did like job placement for like management consulting firms. Right. So who like to be totally frank, like do the brand new shit bad. Right. <laughs> like, um, so maybe I am inserting my own bias here a little bit. Right. But like when you're thinking about your sort of unique selling proposition and the things that you're doing that sort of give a leg up to a potential client. How does your approach differ? Because I could, I could sort of insert my own bias and sort of say like, man, Sebastian's like, he's killer at these different types of things, or, you know, he's got this expertise in these kind of things, or he's digging here and here, but like, what, what are most places sort of getting wrong about brand positioning and, and how are you doing it in a way that's different? You mean places that actually do work with brand or places? Yeah. In- okay. Yeah. So like other consultants specifically, mm-hmm. right? Um, Cause you could, I mean, you could find like so many places that are just going to come in and do That's a brand cool. redesign or rebranding or all of that stuff. Everything you're talking about, is just so much deeper and interconnected and holistic. And, and I would love to maybe sort of, you just sort of talk about your approach and, and the mistakes that you're seeing other people play. Um, making the the first thing i'm gonna say is a disclaimer i i got no beef with brand consultants i love them and i learn from all of them like i every month i'm buying brand strategy books and i keep reading the same shit but in every book i'm just looking for that two lines that i need to just improve my shit Mm. so i I love brand consultants and brand strategies who i who i just hate is like big five consulting all these big fancy agencies, they will send you some some dude who just graduated. And then a senior will come and the senior will tell the newly graduate, well, you know what? We will have their employees do the work for us. We put together a nice presentation. We deliver the data. Then they build the client 400K. That's it. You, you want to call them for a workshop? They will spill a client 50K. I hate those guys. And also like the most like, Big five consulting and ethical practices galore. It's just typical. So yeah. those are the guys I dislike. Now, what do I see wrong there? I said it. The lack of tailoring, you know? I see that also with some brand strategies. They will come in and it will be the brand personality prism and SWOT analysis. And it's all splattering templates and frameworks. And uh, the, let's do this cram style workshop. You just keep recycling these frameworks from different areas of marketing and branding and uh, project management. And you make them part of your brand strategy process, which in the end turns out being less tailored and turns out becoming like just this factory of brands. I don't like that approach. Of course, that, that kind of shoots myself in the foot there 
because it means more work for me. Because I walk into each client, I have my frameworks, but still sometimes I will just make up new shit for them. More hours, but okay, that's that's how I like to do it. Another thing that I see that's super common. I see very few brand strategies that combine brand strategy with business strategy. Mm. And I actually like doing that and I've been digging into business strategy because a big task sometimes is getting the client to mentally separate brand from marketing. And the only way you can do that is framing brands as a branch of business strategy that affects marketing culture and sales and recruiting. Mm. However, to do that, you need knowledge in business strategy. You need how to, to know how to tailor it, how to make it work, how to make it also be not just fancy words. So that's the big one, because here's the thing. When the brand is separate from the business strategy, it, will, it could become a source of temporary advantage. That then the moment somebody, you know, positioning, as you know, it's fluid. A new technology could come in and fuck up your positioning and a new competitor could come in and just destroy your positioning. But if your competitive advantage is not just based on positioning, but also on your business strategy and on the stuff you do uniquely well as a company, then you are holding more of a unique position. Hmm. So bridging that gap has been a new obsession of mine between brand strategy and business strategy. You chain those two together, and I think more, most companies will have a superpower. That is that is so cool. How do you articulate that to your brand part or your partners, right? Like your your company partners, your organizational partners, um, as a differentiator? Because I, I could see it sort of being like an easy selling point, right? Because you're you're digging deep in so many areas that most places aren't going to, right? And your approach is going to be way more holistic, way more interconnected, all those different types of things. At the same time, I could see it being like a really tricky thing, right? Like founders love their companies, right? Or, uh, you know, CEO is like, they're so passionate. They're so like about it. And when you're this sort of like cult leader, right? You've got no objectivity about like your, the outside things, right? You just think this, your organization is the best how do you dance that dance right of you know you're working with people that like love the organization they're so proud of it they're proud of their work all of that kind of stuff and here you are sort of like tweaking and trying to sort of have them how are you how are you doing that dance well they come to you with a problem right yeah. so no matter how cool they think their organization is they still came to you for something now when a lot goes into educating a client you know even before closing a deal, I will deliver gladly a free workshop because usually it makes, there I can express the full depth of what we will do for that specific company. And that just makes the entire process way easier. I will just be transparent with the process. This is state, this is month one to month 12. This is how many workshops we will have. This is what they will cover. This is why they will cover it. So the more you educate them, the more open they are to changes. Of course, like, it's not a perfect world. So some clients will just get strategy, ignore half of the advice you give them, then say, oh, you know, this sucks. And happens, happens to everybody. But conveying the differentiator is a lot of education. It's a lot of stuff that uh, I usually say to my clients in one-on-one -on -one meetings. And uh, like, I have other differentiators that I usually leverage that are spread also in my content, but I just don't state openly because reasons and they are some of them are very effective but um, it's, it's mainly that e educating the client and helping them understand like you came to me for this reason mm -hmm. this is happening because of that i know you love your company and i want your team to perceive me as part of your team like we need to i'm not part of your company but they need to feel that i'm an ally and i am an ally to you as a client so my best interest is that you thrive because if you thrive, I thrive. But you, you need to be also like, you know, communication. You need to be very clear from the beginning. You need to tell them, you know, the thing with strategy work is that most companies don't have a real strategy because doing strategy work sucks. It's thinking, it's effort, and the human brain doesn't like that. So you need to tell them it's going to be uncomfortable. We're going to have hard moments. And we, we just need to be bluntly honest with each other, even though it sucks. 
So usually when you have a relationship with a customer and you have hard moments, those tend to be the best relationships because those hard moments just mean you're being honest with each other. And you have these chances to just clarify. This is what's going mm -hmm. on. This is why I'm doing this. And this is why you shouldn't do that. And here's another thing that you asked me, like, what don't I like about some consultants is like not challenging the client. Yeah. Like if you come in and you're just going to be a yes man, they're wasting money on you. And you're not doing yourself a favor as a professional because yes, you're very cool to be around. You're probably funny and you're a pleasure to have on meetings, but you came in, gave a bunch of advice they didn't listen to, and you came out and there was no difference, no impact. Ultimately, I think that's gotta be bad, bad for your business. And there's so many places that operate in that space. I mean, I, I would argue that so much of management consulting is exactly that, right? Like you, you pay a high premium, you jump through these different hoops to sort of like to work with this organization, they ask a ton of information and you essentially get back like a, a huge PowerPoint and a bunch of data sets and yeah. like a, and a book report, like, and, mm -hmm. and that's it. And it's like, and then you've got this like massive billable, like no guarantees, no, like no nothing, no accountability, like no anything. Um, so I, I, I so appreciate that insight because I think you, you get into, I think the crux of what some of the challenges are with those things, but also sort of articulating why the hands-on approach is so unique and different. Yeah. You know, I like to say that, you know, some people do brands as if they were Sarah. I like to mibble more Savile Row. Hmm. I want to tailor that. It's not that you come in and you can buy five garments of the same thing. You come in, we measure you. It takes a while. You come back, you, you pick the, the cloth, you pick the design, you get it adapted to you, you get it again adapted. And finally, after a while, you will get your result, but it's tailored. Hmm. Whereas it's comfortable to just walk into maybe even not just not a strategy agency. It's comfortable to just walk into a design agency and tell them, yo, I need a brand because I merged. And they will say, amazing. Uh, how much do you make per year? A hundred. They say like, they say they make a hundred million. You go, nice. 10 million to redesign this amazing logo. And all your colors will give you some color guidelines, some new fonts. Here you go. Amazing. They didn't touch your strategy though. And I value yeah. design work. It's just that I value it less with our strategy. Also, I'm not a yeah. designer by background, so that's part of it. Yeah. But there, I mean, to the point you made earlier, I mean, they're so integrated, right? And you need to start with the, the pieces that you talked about, like brand is so much more, you know, so that I, I love, I love that, that approach. Um, when you're looking at the the future, right, and where market trends are going, consumer behavior, and all those things, how do you see the concept of positioning and the work changing in like the next five, ten years? With the knowledge I have now, I say that positioning will become more and more important, right? Because you will you will keep like the bar keeps being lower. AI is just lowering the bar even more. I was listening yesterday to this video, which basically showed me that you can build a marketing agency completely with AI. So the bar is crashing. So positioning is going to be key because positioning is making your client understand that you have a specific value and telling them why. And telling them why you are different from all the other people that claim to have the same value. That's why it's going to become key. Now. You know, in five months from here, OpenAI could tell us, yo, we discovered AGI. It can consult, it can design, it can work, it can apply it to a robot and it can build a dam and fix your sink and humans don't need to work anymore. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, probably positioning goes out the window. You don't need it because the economy will never be the same. It will never recover from AI and, or maybe it will destroy us. But right now, except for disruptions, we cannot predict it's going to become way more important. Because again, even look at the online space, the creators, there's no differentiation. All I see is every day is copywriters, ghostwriters, email writers. It's just an ongoing flow of people that have been told 
by people who, by, by the way, people who grew their brands in 2021, they are telling people, just start posting with some personality and that's going to be enough. It isn't. It's not. It isn't. It's not. It's not. Maybe the last question here, because you, you touched on, I think, something that, that is, is huge, right? If, if you were going to advise somebody that's a new creator or sort of hopping into this sort of independent space, how would you tell them to sort of get started? Uh, and, and what would, how would your advice maybe sort of differ than the common stuff out there? Right. Cause like everybody sort of sees the common examples and my inbox is like filled with like emails from different creators that I follow around, like nail your customer avatar. And it's like, you're in a unique selling, like totally get it. Like, and I'm not saying those aren't important because they are right. Like those are basics, but like, how is your advice going to differ? First of all, stop thinking about the numbers. There's this, you don't need 200K followers to be making money. Like nobody has needed 200K followers to make money before. Why do they need it? Why do we need it now all of a sudden? You know, the thing is many creators come from nine to fives and they are detached from the business world and they enter a branch of the business world. So they don't realize that even to this day, most businesses are quite behind in everything marketing, in everything technology, in everything, anything. That's not just doing business in real life, which is how they make trillions. Of course, I'm not talking businesses because I say businesses. People think Apple, that's a business. Yes, but it's not the example I'm, I'm talking about. I'm talking like your local business, your dominant company in your country that somehow made it there. How did they make it there? That's the source there. Now, how is the advice going to be fair? First of all, stop trying to sell to other creators who are learning how to sell. Because there's this echo chamber of marketing, selling to marketer, marketers who sell to marketers. The best advice is learn a skill, ideally one that you actually like and not one that you picked up just because you happen to pay a 7K course from a big account. And now you're stuck doing like, I don't know, email writing or whatever kind of writing or ads management, just pick a skill that you feel like you like, do it for free for a while, do it for some people, get some results, you know, follow the hormosi thing. Just go to your local business and offer that skill. If you make the money, good. Now you can charge. Fine. Then stand out from the competition and target businesses. I see so many talented writers who know storytelling, who could really leverage the skills they have. So many talented designers that could stop designing banners for 50 bucks and just go for companies that would rather hire them that pays a big agency or maybe would rather hire them that hire full time some designer. And just go serve people that have money because this is the other thing. When you're selling to other creators and other beginners, you're selling to people that have one, limited budget, but two, you're selling to people that are putting most of their hopes in your service. And that's a responsibility you don't want because now you told them, I will bring you clients with my writing and they're going to go, oh my God, this is the breakthrough. If you don't, you know, perception, if they perceive that and you fuck up that perception, your reputation is slowly starting to chip away. Now, if you're a designer and people pay you 200 bucks for a banner, they will expect something that it converts because you promised them because somebody told you to promise them that it converts and it doesn't convert. Again, your reputation is gone and also they will get burned and they will not want to be a creator because I have a, I, I have a client who invested in one of these big influencer, like big creator courses. Mm -hmm. And this person was completely down because first of all, there was some dirt inside the course that she wasn't expecting. Second, it was kind of a cult where nobody was seeing the dirt. And third, it didn't work for her because the, it just wasn't meant to work. It was meant to sell you a dream. So just put your stuff, at, learn it and put the stuff at service of somebody that has money and that can actually benefit. Because you said it best. You brought up the best example. You look at companies out there. They write the same. They sound the same. They do everything the same. If you at least know how to do copywriting, you can make those people more money by just optimizing a landing page. Mm -hmm. Don't say people need to become brand strategists. Just take your skill and develop it to a point that you're better than the low bar that is the business world because it's a low bar.
That is fabulous advice, I think, to, to end on. Sebastian, where can people learn more about you? Where, where should they go? How do they follow you? Like, where, where do you direct them? Uh, follow me on Twitter, mostly, right now. Uh, Dsebas Hidalgo is the tag. If not, is the handle. If not, go to LinkedIn. I'm also there daily to put in more effort because, you know, another advice for creators, LinkedIn is where people hide the money because companies are there. So I go to LinkedIn. It's actually a great place. You just need to get used to the vibe. And uh, on LinkedIn, I have my full name. Just follow me on Twitter and I will lead you to my LinkedIn probably, which is easier because my name is pretty long. And you can find me on Amazon. Find me. The book is Are You Ford or Ferrari? You type that and you will find it immediately. It's like 12 bucks or something. And it's anything you need to get started with positioning. And the reviews on it are amazing. I was just checking them out um, before, before we hopped on, but like super practical. Um, I mean, it, whether you're whether you're sort of startup or bigger business, um, you know, really, really sort of great advice. Sebastian, this has been awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It was a pleasure. Love.